if we're excited today, I want to give you some practical tips for what we talked about last Sunday. Last Sunday we started a two-part series talking about gaining victory over temptation. And we realized that all temptation is ultimately from the enemy. And it's really interesting. Some of you reached out to me this week and said, man, after last Sunday's sermon, I got hit from every angle. <laughs> Temptations came out of every corner that possibly could, and I thought about your sermon all week long. Some of you even wrote me and said, hey, I've had this temptation that has just hit me in the face, and I need to know how's the best way to handle this temptation. That's exciting for me as a pastor, okay? Because let me tell you what that is. It's discipling people to help you be able to learn how to get over temptation rather than temptation getting over you. Jesus said, go and make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them all these things that I have taught you. It's always interesting because discipleship happened in Scripture as they were going. It happened on a daily basis. It didn't happen in a group. It didn't happen in a, a classroom. It didn't happen in a school. It, it happened as they were going. Jesus would, as he was walking along, would say, oh, let's look at this fig tree. Let's talk about this fig tree. And he would teach them lessons about the fig tree. Jesus would teach them lessons about prayer and lessons about multiplication and lessons about serving people. But he didn't teach a class on how to serve people. He, he got a basin of water and he got a towel and as they walked in the door he said, come here, let me wash your feet. Amen. That was his teaching. Yeah. I think sometimes we make discipleship a little bit too hard, a little bit too difficult. But I want you to understand, you can get over temptation. When that temptation hits you, it's not something you just heard in a sermon. It's real. It works. The Word works if we will work the Word. Amen? And so I want you to understand today some practicalities. And, and so I know that from what you're about to hear today, I want you to be able to walk out of here and say, I can do that. That makes sense to me. I can do that. I don't want you to walk out and go, what in the world did he just say? I, I, don't, you know, I, I don't understand. It doesn't make sense. I, I, I had a pastor one time that I sat under. He was a very smart man, a brilliant man. He had a doctorate in theology and a doctorate in ministry and a doctorate in something else. And here I was. I walked away. Every single week, a minister, I walked away and I was doing studies and I walked away and I'm going, man, I'm not sure I really got his message today. I'm not really sure I understood what he said today. What I had to do was go home and pull out my Greek and Hebrew books and then two and three hours later I'm like, oh, I, I got a little bit of the gist of that. But then I thought to myself, the common person sitting in the pew didn't get any of that because they don't have the privilege that I have of having all those study books and all that kind of stuff. And so I said, Lord, I, I want to do what you've called me to do. I want to preach the gospel and I want to do it in such a simple way that anybody could walk out of the building and go, I can do that. Amen. That makes sense. I got it. I can do that. Yeah. So we need to get today is that the enemy is out to destroy you. The Bible says he is like a roaring lion. He roams about the earth seeking whom he may devour, 1 Peter chapter 5. And his goal is to alienate us from God and to disrupt our fellowship with him. And if he can do that, then he has successfully disarmed and disabled you and I. Last week we talked about the characteristics of temptation. And we received some strong encouragement from Paul about it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 1 through 13. Several times Paul said, I'm doing this as a warning to you. 
Once Paul even said, I've written this down so that it will be an example to you who are in living in the latter age. I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to figure out that we are living in the latter age. We are living in the last days. So what an encouragement, but also what a strong, stern warning from the Apostle Paul that you and I need to take heed. I've seen so many times where temptations have come in and they have destroyed good people. Because temptations, without defeating them, you give in to them and they end up destroying your life. Sin destroys you. Sin decimates you so that you're no longer useful. So let's look at some ways today. In verse 13 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, because that's where I really want to park for the next few moments. Verse 13 simply says, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. Let me just stop right there. The enemy wants you to think you're the only one being tempted in the way in which you're being tempted. In fact, I hear people say this to me all the time. Pastor D, people don't understand what I'm dealing with. They don't understand what I'm going through. They don't understand the struggles that I face on a daily basis. And my response to them is, that's what the enemy wants you to think. Because if you feel like you're isolated, you're all alone, and what you're going through is only to you, you feel hopeless. You feel helpless, and you feel like there's no one who cares. No one who loves you. And you'll never be able to get in the mindset of a victor and defeat and overcome the temptation of the devil. Satan's job is to try to narrow our focus onto something so minuscule, which is the object that is enticing us or tempting us. I don't know if it seems this way to you, but when I'm being tempted, that's all I can think about. That's all I can think about. <laughs> A lot of you have talked to me about my Hershey bar <laughs> from last Sunday. I said, was that just a joke? Could you have said no to the Hershey bars? I absolutely could have said no to the Hershey bars, but I did not. I confess. I failed. I ate all stinking four of them, and they were delicious. Had there been ten, I'm convinced I would have had ten Hershey bars last week. But here's the deal. The moment I was sitting at my desk and I pulled out that drawer and I saw that there were Hershey bars, do you realize, now this is a stupid, simple illustration, but it will fit with whatever you're going through in your life, okay? Here it is. When I saw the Hershey bars, nothing else mattered. <laughs> Somebody could have said to me, would you like to go to Fred's? And I'm like, I've got Hershey bars. I got Hershey bars. I got Hershey bars for them bad boys. Because you know why? That's all I was thinking about. That's all I was thinking about. The enemy does that when we're tempted. If you're tempted with lust... You're not thinking about your spouse. You're thinking about the object of which you're lusting. And that's all you can think about. It consumes you because the enemy wants to get your mind so focused on that one single object that you miss sight of the big picture. God, our Heavenly Father, on the other hand, desires that we keep sight of the big picture. These temptations in your life are no different from what others 
experience. But you just don't get it, Pastor D. You know what? I may not. I may not be tempted the way that you are tempted. But the scripture says that Jesus has faced every temptation known to man. Yet he sinned not. So I don't know what you're being tempted by. I don't know if it's drugs, alcohol, lust, pornography. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's gambling. I don't know, if, I don't know what, your, what your temptation is. But I know this. Jesus has already faced it. And he defeated it. And if he defeated it, you and I can defeat it as well. Because when Christ took up residence in our lives in the form of the Holy Spirit, you and I now live, move, walk, have our being in the power of the resurrection. So the power of the resurrected Christ now lives in me. And that is why you and I are able to say, no, no, no. But then he goes on to say, and God is faithful. Period. Did you catch that? When I'm reading this verse, it says in my Bible, it says, and God is faithful. Period. Folks, you need to get that. Punctuality is a real deal. Okay? This is not Facebook. This is not Twitter. This is not Instagram. This is real life. And God is faithful. Listen, there has never been a moment that God has failed you. There has never been a moment that God has let you down. There has never been a moment that God has turned his back on you. It might feel like it, and the devil wants you to think that. But God himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. So if you think that God has turned his back on you, if you think that God has failed you, if you think that God has let you down, it is a lie from the pit of hell. Don't you dare believe that. Because if the enemy can cause you and I to believe that God is not faithful, then you and I will choose the alternative. The alternative comes but to kill, steal, and destroy. God comes that we might have life and have it more abundantly, fully, freely. Listen, I see so many people who is not walking in the freedom that Jesus Christ died for. They're not walking in that freedom. Oh, they may have prayed a prayer. Oh, they may have read their Bible a couple times. But there is freedom when we are walking in Christ. There is freedom. There's freedom to say yes to God. And there's freedom to say no to the enemy. How do we do that? How do we see the big picture? How do we gain victory over temptation? And God is faithful. Listen to the very next part. He will not. Say that with me. He will not. Say it one more time. He will not. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. I just feel like God's put more on me than than what I can handle. He hasn't put more on you than he can handle. When you and I are in Christ, you are never carrying your load alone. When you and I are in Christ, we are not walking this road alone. Anything that comes against you comes against him. And guess what? You... The Father, Son, the Holy Spirit are a majority. Amen? You will always win. You will always win.
always been. Victory is always yours for the taking as you walk in it. He says clearly he will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. And here's why I say that. Because God sees the big picture. You and I are looking through a tiny hole in an envelope and we don't get to see but just that much of the picture of our lives. But God sees the big picture. You know one thing I always hated? I always hated when somebody would walk up to me. I was probably a teenager at this point. People walk up to me and they thought because I was a teenager, I, they assume that I like putting together puzzles. I do not, okay? I do not like putting together puzzles because I was the guy, somebody would hand me a puzzle in a Ziploc bag, no box, no picture, just the puzzle. It would take me months to work that whole puzzle and it always had at least one piece missing. That make me madder than sin. Let me tell you. <laughs> I couldn't understand that. But you realize that's what life is like? You and I are working a puzzle of life without the picture. But we have to be faithful to keep putting pieces of the puzzle into place. And God will be the one he is the one who started the good work in you, and he's the one who will complete the good work in you. He is faithful and just that he will finish what he has started. And then I love the last part of this. Not only will he not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand, watch what he says, when you are tempted. Notice it didn't say if you are tempted. It said when you are tempted... He will show you a way out so that you can endure. Child of God, listen to me. Those of you who are watching through our iCampus, please listen carefully. There will never be a temptation in your life that you will face that God has not already provided a way for you to escape it. Every single one. God has already provided a way for you and I to get out of that temptation. Well, I couldn't help it. I had to give in to it. I'm human. This is just the way I am. Stop. You can't help it. You can do something about it. It's not just the way you are. What about who he is? He says, I've already made a way. I've already provided your escape. I've already got you ready. All you need to do is take it. Right. So what are some practical ways that you and I can see the big picture and that you and I can take the escape, if you will, or that you and I can build a defense against temptations in our lives? If you're taking notes, then let me give you some very practical steps. Practicality is important because I need you to leave here today and start acting on these things. If we submit to God, resist the devil, he will flee from us. That's a promise, okay? But you must submit to God first. You can't get the steps out of order. Submit to God. What does that mean? Submitting means I am yielding my life to Jesus. If you are not in the Word, you're not yielding. If you're not having a, a, a quiet time with God, you're not yielding. If you're not worshiping, you're not yielding. Okay? What we want to do is we want to skip the yielding process... But that's the hardest part. Total surrender. Yielding everything to God. Well, I feel like, does it matter what you feel like? It is faith over feelings. And faith is not faith until it's put into action. 
Well, I, well, I feel this way. Okay. So I feel ways in my life too, but it doesn't stop things. You got to keep going. It's not about how you feel. Somebody said to me just, just a week ago, she says, I, I don't think I'm coming to church tomorrow because I, I don't feel good. I said, I'm sorry. Sorry you don't feel good. What's, what's wrong? Well, I got a headache. Man, I've had headaches all my life. But you know what? It's not about how I feel. Because sometimes you have to... Faith... It through the feelings. Now think about that for a moment. I may feel this way, but sometimes I have to faith it through the feelings because feelings will lie to you. Why is it people always get sick on Saturday night? Why is it we always feel bad on Sunday morning? Do you not understand that the devil will do everything possible to stop you from following him? Somebody said to me one time, said, but you don't understand, Pastor D. I'm battling depression. Listen, I am not belittling depression, but can I tell you this? Depression is a tool of the enemy. I don't care how you look at it. I don't care how you look at it. But, but, but you don't understand, I'm battling depression. Can I tell you something? As long as you leave God out of the equation, you will continue to battle depression and you will be defeated by it. Because the enemy knows what it takes to keep you down. And if it's depression, if it's a stomach ache, if it's a headache, or whatever it is, you will be out for the count. And let me tell you why he does it. Because you never are just out alone. Listen to me. If I go down, there's a lot of other people that go down with me. Daddies, you need to hear something. If you let every little stinking thing keep you from following Jesus, your wife and your children will no longer follow Jesus either. Because they'll always think it's okay to make an excuse of why we don't follow Jesus. Can I just say there are no excuses when it comes to God? You're either in or you're out. Well, well, I'm a Christian. Can I just say this? I believe more people have Christianity than they have a relationship with Jesus. And there's a big difference. Christianity's religion. I, I get so, whew, I, I just get so taken back when somebody says to me, well, I, I'm having to work on my, my religion. Honey, you don't need to work on your religion. You need to get rid of that stinking thing. Religion is not where you and I need to be. It is a personal, day in, day out, walking relationship with God. And if you don't have a relationship, you don't have anything. Thankfully, some people are starting to wake up to this fact and realize that the religion they practiced for all these years won't get them anywhere but straight to hell. I did a funeral Friday night. And the guy, if he told me once, he told me a thousand times, he said, no prayer and no scripture. Don't mention eternal life. Don't mention heaven. She's a Jehovah's Witness. I said, my, my, my. He said, she's coming back. In fact, she's already back. What? He said, she never believed she was going to be able to get into heaven. There's only a certain amount of people that are going into heaven according to Jehovah's Witness. But she's coming back incarnated as a Pomeranian. (laughs) And my daughter's already bought her. We went out, the day she died, we went out and bought the Pomeranian $2,500. And there's my wife. I'm going to tell you something. My wife dies and she comes back. I hope she comes back something other than a Pomeranian. Amen? (laughs) Somebody said, well, what happened to your wife? I said, she came back as a Maytag D. 
dishwasher. <laughs> okay, I already know I'm about to get crucified over that one. So if you have a, an extra room in your house, you can let me know really soon. <laughs> Glory to God. Sorry about that, Pastor Charlie. I got carried away. <laughs> but I want you to understand that religion will send you to hell. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except but by me. Guys, there's only one way, and it's through Jesus. So what can I do practically to help me overcome temptation in my life. One, if you're taking notes, here it is. Ask yourself questions. Wow, that is profound, isn't it? Ask yourself some questions. Here's what I mean by that. The moment you feel the temptation coming on, before you ever take action on that temptation, be sure to stop and ask yourself some questions and consider the answers to them. Maybe you might ask yourself this question. If I give in to this temptation, what will be the immediate and the future consequences to myself and those around me? Well, what are the consequences? See, most of us, when temptation comes our way, we do not even think about the consequences. All we're thinking about is the gratification we're going to get from it. That's it. But I'm convinced if we will stop for a moment and truly think through what it is we're thinking about doing, we won't do it. What are the consequences? Immediate and future consequences. Might be that you'd ask yourself the question, am I prepared to pay the price? Am I prepared to pay the price. Do you know how many people live a lifestyle of promiscuity? Do you know how many people live a lifestyle of thinking, I can do whatever I want and it will not harm me and there won't be any consequences? And what I love is when somebody says, Oh, Pastor, you ain't got to worry about me. I'm playing it safe. What is safe? What is safe? Had a guy look at me just the other day, and he was, thought it was funny. And he opens his wallet so I could see what he had in his wallet, and he said, I'm safe. I'm good. And I said, let me tell you when you're safe. When you practice abstinence. When you practice sexual gratification outside of God's plan. That is promiscuity and it will always bring a consequence. Well, you don't understand. I've been doing this for years, ain't never had a baby, but let me tell you, there's a greater consequence than a baby. You can raise a baby, but the Bible says that when two people come together, it creates a bond. It creates a union as one. Let, let, let me just let, let me show you what it looks like. Two people have come together as one, but now we're no longer together. I don't care what you do, you'll never smooth out those edges. I don't care what you do, you can tape it, you can do whatever you want to, it'll never go back the same. Because it wasn't meant to. The person you give yourself to ought to be the person that you're going to give yourself to for life. Pastor, what about me? I've been through divorce. What do I do? Grace. Aren't you thankful for God's grace? Aren't you thankful that when, even when we, when things in our life don't turn out the way that God would have them turn out, God gives grace and He forgives. Hallelujah. 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 But listen, if you have a choice to do it right, do it right. Do it right. Single people don't go around giving your body just to anybody who will go to bed 
with you. Listen to me. You are special in the eyes of God. Save yourself. You say, what if I've already messed up? Then start today. Restoration clean today. Start today and say from this point forward, I'm going to keep myself pure. I'm going to keep myself clean. And I'm going to wait on the person God has for me. God will give you the grace for that. Am I prepared to pay the price? Maybe you might ask the question, is there a better way to get this need met? Is there a better way to get this need met that is not outside of God's realm of influence and blessing? Secondly, after you ask yourself some questions, you probably ought to identify your area of weakness. Identify your area of weakness. See, here's the thing. Everybody has areas of vulnerability. Everybody's vulnerable in some area. But, but if you don't know what your area is, then you need to ask God to reveal that to you. In addition, I think you've got to be very mindful of objects, places, or situations that might foster temptation in your life. We talked about some of those last week. And avoid them at all cost. Don't hang out at places you know you have a weakness for. Get away. The Bible says flee, run. There's a word. The first time I ever heard it was from Charles Stanley. And the word is halt. Halt. Many of you know it. Many of you use it, and that is awesome. But for those of you that don't, I want to introduce you. I want to give you a word, and it spells out halt, okay? The word halt is a great reminder not to let yourself fall into a place where your weaknesses are tested. If you're taking notes, write this down. The word H stands for hungry. Hungry. I just got to tell you, when I get hungry, and this is no joke, I am more susceptible to fall to temptation. When I get hungry, I'm more susceptible to fall to temptation. So don't let yourself get to that point. If you need to have a snack, if you do, because when you get hungry, your body starts craving. And sometimes that craving gets out of control. Or if you're angry. You ever notice if you're angry, you get to the place that you just don't give a rip what you do. You don't give a rip who you're with, what you say, what you do. If you're angry, your anger can spin wildly out of control and cause you and I to step into stupid so easily. The L stands for lonely. Don't let yourself get to that point. But you don't understand. I I just, I don't have any family here. Listen, look around. Look around right here. We are a big family. One big family. Don't let yourself get lonely because you'll start looking for companionship in places you ought not be looking. Remember the old country song? Looking for love in all the wrong places. Remember that song? I've met more people who've been looking for love in all the wrong places. And they didn't find love. What they found was a baby. What they found was an addiction. What they found was abuse. What they found was chains of bondage. Are you with me? Yes. When you're lonely... You will look for ways to feel that loneliness. And that loneliness may lead you into the arms of another man's wife or another woman's husband. Oh, no, you didn't set out for that. You didn't plan on that happening. 
But you were lonely, tempted, and it happened. You can stop that. Or tired. Now, I don't know about you, but I can tell you, for me, if I'm any of these, I need to be careful. When I get tired, I come to a place where I'm just like, I don't care anymore. I don't care. I know that's a dangerous place for me. So, I try to make sure that if I'm tired and exhausted, I'm going to get some rest. This past week was a tough week. Even after coming back off a of vacation, I kind of planned the week where I would ease back into things and it would be a light week. But it turned out not to be such a light week. People in the hospital and different things. And there were several nights that I was at the hospital very late. One night I was there till 2, 3 in the morning. And, and you know, it was just like that all week long. So Friday and Saturday came. I made sure by Thursday night I had everything done. Friday and Saturday came, and let me tell you what I did. I did not set an alarm. I slept. You know why? Because I was tired. I don't need to get to the place where I'm tired and exhausted that I don't make good sound decisions. So if you don't take care of yourself, you won't be able to take care of other people around you. So if you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, then you need to know you are much more susceptible to the enemy's schemes and traps than you are when you're not. Satan will always look for opportunities to launch his forces against us. And man, hungry, lonely, uh, angry, lonely, and tired are always breeding grounds for him to launch them. Thirdly, visualize your victory. I want you to think about this for a moment. Too often we set ourselves up for failure by thinking, well, I'm afraid I'm going to slip. Well, I'm afraid I'm going to fall. Faith is the ability to envision something positive before it ever happens. So, by faith, you envision your victory. So you picture having a godly response to the temptation that comes your way. And you literally preach to yourself, tell yourself, all right? People may think you're crazy. Don't worry about it. This is your way of getting victory. Sometimes I have to talk to myself. And I know that people are thinking, what in the world is he doing? Has he lost his ever-loving mind? No, no, I'm talking to myself so that I don't lose my ever-loving mind. All right? Because if I feel myself starting to slip into a temptation, I need to talk myself out of it. That's okay. Don't listen to everybody else. Picture having a godly response to the temptation and tell yourself, here is what I believe the Lord wants me to do. Here's what God would do. You know, we used to wear those old braces that says, what would Jesus do? Those things will work if you pay attention to them. What would he want me to do? How would he want me to respond? Because here's what I know. Once you begin to program your thinking in a faith-filled, godly fashion, then you'll begin to act in the way you think. Amen. Proverbs 23, verse 7. One of my all-time favorite verses. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Right. However you think is how you're going to act. So if you think negative, guess what? You're going to respond negatively. But if you think positively, if you think a godly response, if you think a positive response, then that's how you're going to respond. I've always said most of our lives, what we really need to do is just get rid of the stinking thinking, right? Because our thinking is rotten to the core. And so therefore our living is rotten to the core. Let me give you a fourth one. This is something most people don't want. Be accountable to a friend. Everybody needs accountability. 
Now that's something we don't have a whole lot in our world today. Because everybody needs accountability, but nobody wants to be held accountable. We all want to do our own little thing. We want to do what we want to do, when we want to do it, with who we want to do it, with how we want to do it, and never have to give an account for it. We need to be accountable, folks. You need to find you a confidential, trustworthy brother or sister in Christ who's going to be supportive of you and somebody that you will give permission to speak into your life and to ask you the tough questions. Maybe they need to ask you, what were the temptations you dealt with this week and were you able to withstand the temptation? What are you looking at? What are you listening to? What are you reading? Who are you hanging out with? How's your family life? Listen, we, we don't have accountability because we're afraid to be held accountable. But there is something strengthening about a friend who is there to check on you, knowing where you are and what you're doing. Guys, listen to me. If we have to give an account to someone every day, God will use that person as an encourager and a blessing in our lives to keep us from falling prey to temptation. They can be your escape route to get out. Now, I'm not just talking about anybody. Don't just run out and find anybody because what you'll do is you'll find somebody that loves to gossip and when you tell them what's going on in your life, they're going to go get on the telephone and they're going to call the prayer committee. It ain't praying, but they're going to call the prayer committee. All right? I'm talking about a one confidential brother or sister in Christ that you and I can be totally honest with. And when they ask us a question, we're not going to give them a line. Okay? Honesty. Somebody that knows everything about you. Somebody that could walk up with you and say, hey, you're spending too much time with her. Hey, you shouldn't be doing that. Hey, I've noticed your post on Facebook. Hello? Now, maybe I'm, maybe I'm a little stronger than what I should be, but I love you enough that if I see you post something on stupid on Facebook that's going to destroy your testimony, your witness, and it's going to destroy others along with you, I, I'm going to be the one that loves you enough that I'm going to send you a private message and say, what in the world were you thinking? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, amen. Pastor, I can't believe you'd do that. You don't have the right to do that. If I'm your pastor and I have the right to speak life into you and you want me to pray over you and you want me at the hospital, then bless God, listen, I have the right to speak into your life and say, stop, you're about to do something stupid. Well, I don't want you to do that. Listen, I'd rather somebody tell me not to step into stupid before I step into it. Hello? It stinks. That's exactly right. Ridiculous. But I watch people. I see people post stuff on Facebook, and I'm thinking, now, 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 should you really have gone and done that? You just were praising God on Facebook, and now you're talking stupid. If you can't handle social media, get off of it and quit using it. Because it'll destroy your testimony just like that. Take it down the tubes. Be accountable. Fifthly, set aside a daily quiet time. Oh, Pastor D, that's a no-brainer right there. It's a no-brainer, but let me tell you something. The majority of people who claim to be Christians do not have a daily quiet time. I thought that was a no-brainer. Apparently it's not, and that's the reason I'm telling you. It doesn't matter whether you do it in the morning, whether you do it at noon, whether you do it at night, as long as you are alone with God every single day. Listen, if Jesus himself got away with the Father to recharge, to talk, to get wisdom, to get guidance, if Jesus himself thought that it was so important, don't you and I? Amen. Don't, don't we, should we do that? A daily quiet time. Listen, I'm talking about a daily quiet time where you can turn this off. 
The last thing is you want is right in the middle of your conversation with God and your phone goes, oh, excuse me, God, i got to take this. Now listen, when you're in your daily quiet time with God, nothing, nothing, nothing is more important than your time with Him. Amen. You need to be able to talk to him, and you need to let him talk to you. I'm not talking about rushing in, you give him your laundry list, and you're up and gone. I'm talking about you going in, sitting down, you talk to God, and then you open the Word of God, read, and let him talk to you. Chances are you'll get more out of what he has to say to you than what you have to say to him. It's just a daily quiet time. Well, I don't have 30 minutes. Do you have 15 well, I don't know if I have 15. Start out with five. Here's what I've learned. If you start out with five, you'll do 15 and you won't even miss it. You'll be in there 30 minutes. An hour later, you'll be in there talking to God. You'll be having a time of your life. You won't even miss it. And you look up and you go, oh my goodness, I've already been here an hour. The most powerful time of your Christian walk will come from your daily quiet time. It'll be your time alone with Him where you unload your heart and then He'll be able to energize you and rekindle your spirit and refocus your attention on what it needs to be focused on. Let me give you one more. I'm done. Learn to rely on the Holy Spirit. Not the preacher. Not your group leader. Not somebody else in the church, not your mama, not your daddy, not somebody. Listen, rely on the Holy Spirit until you and I understand how the indwelling helper works in our lives to enable us and empower us. Your attempts and my attempts to resist temptation will only depend upon our own strength and we'll continue to fail. We'll be defeated. But if you submit to God. If you seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, then all of these things will be added to you. If you will submit to God, seek Him first. Resist the devil. Build up your defenses. Depend on the Holy Spirit. You'll be able to gain victory. You'll see it come to pass. And you may be sitting here thinking right now, you may be sitting at home thinking right now, but what if I fail? And that's what Satan wants you to do. Satan wants you to wallow in self-pity, but don't you do it. It's not what if I fail. What if I succeed, Pastor Charlie? What if I don't fail? What if I succeed? What if I actually get victory? Here is my desire for every single one of us. Pastor D, I've got an addiction. Great. What if I fail? I want the times between your failures to get broader and broader and broader. Can I just go ahead and give you a little bit of encouragement? You will fail. You will have times of defeat. You will have times that you're going to slip up because you didn't watch being hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. There are going to be times you're going to slip up. Confess it. Repent of it. Dust yourself off and start over again. And the more you do this, those times will get farther and farther apart. I love it when somebody posts on Facebook, I'm 10 days sober, and everybody's like, I wouldn't get too happy about that. That's just 10 days. I'm like, look, I would celebrate every second I was sober. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Because 10 days turns into 15 days. 15 days turns into 30 days. 30 days turns into 60 days. 60 days turns into 120 days. Are you with me? Yeah. That's getting victory over temptation. And every single one of us can do it. Are you willing? When temptation comes your way and it gives you a way of escape, are you willing to take it? Come on, stand with me all over the house.
every head bowed and every eye closed. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. The worship team is going to sing. I'm going to pray that I'm going to ask you to get to this altar as fast as you can. Every single one of us in this room today are dealing with some type of temptation in our lives. Maybe it's the temptation of pride. Maybe it's the temptation of greed. Maybe it's lust. Maybe you're tempted by pornography or drugs or alcohol. Maybe you're tempted by lying, dishonesty. I don't know what you're being tempted by, but I can tell you this. Every single one of us ought to be running to this altar today and saying, God, help me. Help me to get victory over temptation. Help me to put these six things that we've talked about today in place in my life so that I will not give in to the temptations of the devil and so that I will win and be victorious and I will be a better witness for Jesus. Father, right now, speak to our hearts. Speak to our lives. God, I know there are people here right now, there are people online right now who are dealing with temptation. They're struggling. Some may have given in to it before they even got here this morning. And they already feel guilty. They already feel full of shame. Full of shame. But God, this morning you extend your grace to them. May they come this morning and find forgiveness. May they find grace where they have failed. And the grace to get up and start all over again. God, I don't know what people are dealing with, but you do. And I pray right now that you will help us to be strong and win the battle over temptation. Have your way right now, God, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.